thank you auditory ma'am for the delightful introduction so we are privileged to have in our pre in our presence ambassador sujan archinoy the esteemed director general of the manohar parikkar institute of defense studies and analysis and the chair of think 20 engagement group for india's g20 presidency so has a remarkable track record having served as the ambassador of india to both japan and mexico furthermore he has also led the indian delegation of expert groups comprising of diplomatic and military officials for engagements with china it is with great honor that we extend our warmest welcome to ambassador sujan who will now deliver a keynote address please join me in giving him our undivided attention Namaskar Thank you very much for that uh, warm and generous introduction and I want to thank uh, Professor Bhanu Murthy especially for having worked very hard to set up this uh, T20 side event today on the components and particularities of India's G20 presidency Thank you Professor I wish to acknowledge the presence of my esteemed colleagues professor sachin chaturvedi professor anirban sharma and my colleague miss anandita bhada who is in fact the youngest of our speakers uh, seated here today for being with me and uh, for being so very supportive of this important event it's a wonderful privilege to be here in bangalore and particularly to have a chance to connect with the youth the youth is the future of india and when i look at you these bright faces in the room my heart fills with optimism about the amritkal period in which we have entered between 2022 and 2049 2047 big pardon india will emerge as a developed country as a developed economy and it is you the youth of india that will make a very big contribution to this glorious future that lies ahead of india when i was uh, coming to this uh, dr b r ambedkar school of economics university i was struck by two things that have been attributed to this great thinker and one of the great architects of our constitution and of independent india and he had said that cultivating the mind is the most important objective of human existence and i think it is education that helps to cultivate the mind and without education we cannot make an appropriate contribution to society as the saying in sanskrit goes vidya dhati vinayam vidya dhadati vinayam vinay adhyati patratam patravad dhanam apnoti dhana dharma tatah sukham it is through education that we have humility humility helps us to build a better character when we have a good character we are better able to create wealth also and such wealth is to be used for the betterment and progress of society the other thing which struck me that dr b r ambedkar had said with equal emphasis is that we are indians firstly and lastly to me that implies a great unity of purpose a great consensus building on our glorious future for we cannot hope to progress without unity and consensus again as the sanskrit saying goes yatha heke chakred na rathasya gatir bhavat evam purush karena vina daivam na sidhyate just as a chariot cannot hope to move on one wheel so also a great society like ours cannot hope to move ahead on to its 
path for a glorious future without unity and it is not only unity it is also purposeful action that is required evam purush karen bina daivam na siddhyate to achieve our destiny we have to work hard as well and these are the two takeaways that i have from dr b r ambedkar's own profound thinking friends india's g20 is a very important moment it is for the first time that any g20 presidency has converted itself into a human centric movement a people centric movement one that is enthused with the concept of vasudhaiva kutumbakam one earth one family one future ayam nija parovethi ganana laguchet sam laguchet sam ayam nija parovethi ganana laguchet sam when you think this is mine and this is yours we are operating with a petty mindset udar charitram to vasudhaiv kutumbakam it is those with a broader magnanimous mindset that are able to treat the entire earth as one family and i think india has exhibited through its ancient culture that we operate on the basis of vasudhaiv kutumbakam that informs our g20 presidency as well this is also for the first time that developing countries four in a row are chairing the g20 indonesia india brazil south africa and india has become the voice for the global south as the prime minister himself has said on a number of occasions including when he chaired and interacted with 125 countries of the global south that india represents the voice of the global south and india has been recognized as a leader of the global south most recently as you are aware during prime minister's visit to papua new guinea the prime minister of papua guinea no less openly acknowledged that the prime minister of india was a leader of the global south this is in fact testimony to india's leadership of the global south and the manner in which we seek to represent the interests of countries around the world our g20 therefore is inclusive it is purposeful it is ambitious it is action oriented and we must therefore rise to the occasion as one in our endeavors today the world is in a period of great flux india's g20 presidency comes at a moment of great turmoil great tumult on the international stage all the factors that have made globalization such a prolific process in the past are under challenge whether it is trade whether it's technology whether it is finance whether it is movement of people and human resources these have been challenged virtually every geography around the world is experiencing contradictions and conflict and i'd like to summarize these as the seven t's the seven t factors the first is conflict and contestation over trade since not all countries have benefited equally from the process of globalization a large part of the world today remains in distress in debt distress many countries have not been able to benefit from the wto process some have gamed the system some have learned to play the game much better than others so the t of trade which is meant to actually globalize the world economy has in fact created pockets of affluence and there are contradictions in this system with the wto today able to provide any kind of relief it's in shambles in terms of its operating mechanisms whether it is trade negotiation or dispute settlement the second t is that of technology unlike trade which is fungible and more difficult to control therefore the world is not talking about decoupling they are talking about de-risking because in a globalized world the interdependence is such that you cannot cut off 
and you cannot put off the genie put the genie back into the bottle but technology is another field of emerging contestation where there is an effort being made to control the flow of technologies through sanctions and restrictions export controls and this is what is going to define the future especially as quantum physics physics and artificial intelligence make their full impact known to us through emerging technologies the third t is that of territory the territorial disputes whether in the indo pacific or in europe we have this problem of unresolved historical disputes the fourth is that of terrorism for without peace and security you cannot have progress and terrorism now is all pervading it affects all parts of the world the fifth is that of tenets and narratives whose system is superior in dealing with the post covid recovery period whose system is superior is it democracy and the liberal trading order or is it in fact uh, the autocratic and authoritarian systems state led capitalism that can provide these answers and the world lacks consensus on this today the sixth is that of transparency without there being transparency there is absolutely no way to build consensus for capabilities are known when we look at statistics when we look at military capabilities also we can count the number of ships and planes and tanks that a country has but intentions are not known motivation is not known that makes for the last and seventh t that is the t of trust which is utterly lacking today friends we have therefore to think about this in the context of the fourth industrial revolution that is before us today this great age of quantum physics and artificial intelligence is a layer that is coming on to the third industrial revolution that provided the information age that information age was accompanied by a comparatively level playing field in terms of manufacturing globally and that too allowed some to fall through the cracks the first and the second industrial revolutions in my view in any case favored the colonial powers whether it was the invention of the locomotive or the steamship in the first industrial revolution or the second industrial revolution when these developed countries took 150 years 100 years or more to develop using the developing countries as hinterland for their raw materials and resources the second industrial revolution also was in my view not a level playing field the third one gave us hope but it has not delivered fully the fourth comes with its own dangers in terms of the possibility of the world dividing itself along unprecedented issues especially in emerging technologies india's rise ladies and gentlemen is something that is a given today india today has emerged as the fastest growing large economy in the world it is going to account for more than 20% of global economic growth in the years to come we have infrastructure and connectivity in this country being developed at breakneck speed we can see this by way of evidence in recent years across the country and we are committed to inclusive growth we are committed to gender equality we have seen how india in recent years under a strong and visionary leadership a committed leadership has taken global initiatives as well such as the international solar alliance or for that matter the coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure or for that matter the one sun one world one grid to my mind the one sun one world one grid is almost vedantic in approach where we look at the possibility of there being one brahman and the rest as atmans seeking to connect with the force of the brahman the sun as the ultimate provider of energy of green energy that we seek today by way of transition from fossil fuel based economies but in this india has also provided its values its ethics its morals its ancient civilizational ethos of peace and non violence its ancient civilizational ethos of being there for everyone within india 
therefore the G20 is a jan bhagidari movement globally it is vasudhaiva kutumbakam and it is india therefore that can also provide not just vaccines for pandemics but also the vaccine of ethics and values to the rest of the world we are in a position therefore to emerge as a vishwa guru a leader of the global south with a people centric approach friends societies and nations are at the heart of this discourse today in terms of how we forge consensus on the global stage to my mind the westphalian system of nation states has not been fully eroded in fact in today's changing rapidly changing global landscape we find that power is fractured that no one country has the ability to dominate to dictate on all issues at all times to all countries we find that there is a greater movement towards multipolarity at a time when multilateralism has weakened there is a movement towards greater plurilateralism there is a movement towards hedging and multi alignment we are living in an era therefore which is full of challenges and opportunities and it is in this context that we must remember that at the heart of the conflicts that we see today is still the concept of nation state nationhood of boundaries of territories of us versus them feeling societies can play a role in ameliorating this by building a body of higher values that connect people around the world at the same time we must also remember that decisions at the level of intergovernmental negotiations issues that are at the heart of peace development growth progress these are primarily led by governments but they also need guidance from civil society from ngos from other parts of our communities but there should be a proper balance in this it cannot be that societies will lead these negotiation nor can it be that only nation states and governments can lead this it requires therefore a unity of purpose and working together we have to operate as one as i said before this chariot cannot move on one or two wheels it must have all wheels moving in unison we in the g20 particularly in the think 20 are at the heart of this consensus building you as the youth the future of india will also contribute to this thought process the think 20 after all is the ideas bank we are in the process today of looking at a vast number of ideas that have come proposals suggestions many issue briefs have been published many have been scrutinized and written by experts some of whom are present here today and all the task forces are doing very well we hope that this will culminate into a very successful think 20 summit in mysore on the 1st and 2nd of august i do hope that some of you will also find time to travel one and a half hours from here to mysore to attend that we have seen how for instance task force 1 focusing on macro economics is today looking at post covid recovery and growth when the threat of some recession is also looming around when the threat of debt distress is also before us today it is minds such as those gathered here today that have to address the challenge of macroeconomic growth and stability task force 2 dealing with the digital challenge must provide for what we call digital public infrastructure that is open that is accessible that also ensures that as the world moves into the digital space particularly powered by ai that we do not descend into a digital colonization of sorts with regard to data which is the new gold or infrastructure itself or the transactions that take place who controls them will we be sovereign in this regard or not 
Task Force 3, very ably led by Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, with which I also associate as co-chair, has primarily at the heart of the matter, in my view, is Prime Minister Modi's proposal for lifestyle for environment. The whole idea that if we work together, we can actually make a difference. We can build at the individual level through power of conviction, through power of implementation and practice of certain values in our lives, we can create a pro-planet people. One that will be committed and dedicated to sustainable consumption. As Gandhiji had said, the earth has enough to meet everyone's needs, but not to meet everyone's greed. And therefore, I think this is very important today. In Task Force 4, I think the green transitions will be all important. But it is not enough for the West to say that we need mitigation. Alongside mitigation, we also require adaptation. And adaptation is not something that will come easily. It will require vast sums of money. It will require technologies. And these, these will have to be made available to the developing countries as well in order to transit from fossil fuels to renewables and green energies. India has made its commitments well known. India is the only country that has achieved its commitments made at the Paris uh, Climate Change Convention well ahead of time through our Panchamrita. I will not go into the details because today, uh, you know, Gurudev, Google can tell you what Panchamrita is. But India is one of those that is committed to lifestyle for environment and reducing the carbon footprint in our economy as we move towards greater adaptation as well. Task Force 5, which deals with international financial institutions and multilateral development banks, has a major challenge to deal with today. Structures that have not been touched for decades, which put power in the hands only of developed economies, today must look at how finance can be made more readily available in larger quantities. A combination of the governmental finance with private sector finance, with hybrid finance, how to open up finance that is already available to make it available to those that require it. And patchwork reforms will not help of the type that have been attempted, for instance, in the past, in uh, the immediate aftermath of the global financial and economic crisis when basic, vote, basic voting rights were increased and certain debt uh, you know, suspension has also been given recently. Debt relief has been given uh, by way of an infusion of $650 billion worth of uh, relief by, for instance, the IMF. But that is not enough when the developed countries, one way or the other, control all decision making. 40% of all SDRs are in their hands. The rest, by way of new arrangements to borrow or bilateral uh, borrowing arrangements, are also in their hands. And that makes for an unequal world. SDGs, again, very important. There are many, you know, principal thinkers and actors here who are dealing with SDGs. But for me, the most important will remain food security. And in this India, if I have to give one idea, I would say that India can show the way ahead with regard to millets. This is, after all, the year of the millet. There is much more to it, and other speakers will naturally uh, give their opinions. The last one, of course, is Task Force 7, which speaks of reform multilateralism, which I also uh, chair uh, alongside another colleague uh, from the ICWA. And here we must co continue to call for reforms of the United Nations, fundamental reforms, to a structure that is archaic, given to a particular time. It was suitable for perhaps a different age, 1945 at the end of the Second World War. It has seen very little change. There is a permanent membership of the Security Council that privileges certain countries. There is a veto power that in fact has made the Security Council fairly dysfunctional today. The non-permanent membership was expanded only once in 1965 from 11 to 15. It has never been reformed thereafter. The intergovernmental negotiations, the text-based negotiations have gone nowhere since 2007. And one can say that the privileged powers who seek 
and continue to seek exceptionalism are hoist on their own petard. They are unable to form that consensus. It is here that the G20 should step in under India's leadership and provide a pathway, provide a direction to a large number of the world's major powers, economies and countries to step away from that gridlock of conflict and contestation, to step away from the clogged arteries and highways of multilateralism towards a new future. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you will all play a great part in this endeavor. But we cannot do it without effort. As the Sanskrit saying goes, Udyamena hi sidhyanti karyani na manorathaya na hi suptasya simhasya pravishanti mukhe mriga. What does this very profound Sanskrit teaching inform us? It tells us that Udyamena hi sidhyanti karyani. It is only through industriousness that we can hope to achieve something. Na hi manorathaya. You cannot build castles in the air and hope to achieve something. Even a sleeping lion, lion he may be, cannot imagine that the deer which is grazing in the forest will automatically come and walk and enter into its mouth. Even a lion has to work for its next meal. Some effort is required, some endeavor is required. Let us therefore join hands to make India's G20 presidency a great success. Let us rededicate dedicate ourselves to the task of making India great and prosperous in Amrit Kaal. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Uh, those were some wonderful presentations and for the Q&A session I would li like to request our students to engage with discussions with our panelists and ask questions. So anyone who would like to ask a question may raise their hand. I didn't have a question so much as to express my gratitude to the uh, young people who have made such wonderful presentations today. In fact, uh, there is a great deal more that I learned today than I have done in many of my own meetings. And so I think the credit should go to you for covering such a vast range of topics. Uh, virtually every task force has been covered brilliantly today. And uh, I have been around the country engaging students uh, in many universities through such outreach events. But I must say that the quality of the presentations here exceeded my expectations well, well, beyond, well beyond the norm. And I think uh, some credit for this, no doubt, goes to you individually for all the hard work that you put in. But there is also credit to be given to your mentors and to your teachers. And I think Professor Anumurti may also take some credit. <laughs> and if you do have any questions of your own, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so, hi. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank all the distinguished speakers for uh, those insightful talks. So, I have two questions, sir. So, one is, uh, I also totally agree and subscribe to your idea that India is uh, going to be a Vishwa Guru when it comes to South-South cooperation or be it triangular co cooperation. So at a time when India is heading G20, how do you look at China's interference and how do you look at China's dominance in Global South? For me, the G20 is not a, a gladiatorial arena in which uh, we should allow bilateral differences uh, to creep in. For that would be the surest way of wrecking the only large representative and competent body that we have today from carrying out its mandate. So I think it's not just India and China, but any country that has differences with another one 
over trade technology or those seven T's that I mentioned, over ideologies, over competing models of development, they should not bring those bilateral differences into the G20 forum. For the G20 forum provides us a chance today in a representative group, bringing in 19 major countries and economies and one big group called the EU together in one room. And this is a golden opportunity to see if there is some low-hanging fruit available, to see if there is a chance to convince the contesting powers to step away from their contestations, to do something for the global community. Not because they are full of the milk of human kindness, but because they must also realize that these are challenges that face both the developing as well as the developed countries, as has been brought out. We are now talking of recession in some developed economies. We are talking of certain debt distress in developed countries. Professor Bhanumurthy asked you rhetorically, which is that country that is likely to default? And the answer is obvious. It is not a country only in the global south. Those are smaller problems. So we should look at the G20 as a very valuable opportunity and platform for consensus building. Virtually every large grouping is present in the G20. The permanent members of the Security Council are there. The G7 are also represented there. The developing economies are represented there. The BRICS are also represented there. IPSA is represented there. Many important countries that participate in the East Asia summit process are also somehow involved in this exercise, particularly through their regional fulcrums like, for instance, Indonesia. So we have to look at this as, as uh, something that has to be capitalized on. Um, so I think India and China, let's keep it apart. OK, uh, I have just another question. I'm so sorry. So when we talk about the modalities of South-South cooperation, which Oh, by India the way, I want to comment on the Vishwa Guru part, you know. Yeah. It's not as if India is dying to, you know, proselytize or teach everyone. But the world today is also seeking out India. Because India goes beyond that simple materialistic option, the profit principle. We are today going beyond that as a result of our own civilizational legacy. So before India preaches to the rest of the world, the world itself is seeking a way out of this situation, dichotomy of binary choices being presented. It's either this way or that way. It's either, you know, X-led uh, coalition or Y-led coalition. It's either a liberal uh, open, uh, you know, trading order or some kind of uh, state-led capitalism. We don't need to get into that. India has the ability and the vision, particularly at this stage when we have the resources to match some of our, you know, vision, that we provide a third choice to the rest of the world. That is where the Vishwa Guru part comes in, leadership of the global south. But it is not a leadership in which we seek to dominate. It is a leadership in which we want to subsume ourselves in the wants, aspirations and visions of the Global South. Self, you know, uh, elimination, are, are the, it, it comes with no ego. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I think question. you answered my second question as well, so may other. 